Hello and a warm welcome to the True Crime Cocktail Hour. How was your week? Uh huh. Mm. Oh. Well, it sounds like you're in need of some me time. Lucky for you, this is exactly what we do here at the True Crime Cocktail Hour. This is where we sit down every Friday after a tough week of work. We relax, we have a drink together if you want. And as long as we're here, I might as well tell you about a mysterious true crime case. The topic of today's case and the motive for today's murder is the oldest in the history of mankind. Money. More specifically, we'll be talking about an inheritance and two brothers and one sister fighting over it. However, none of these three people involved in today's story are either the victim or the murderer. The dynamics in this case are much more complicated and very unbelievable. So let's not lose any more time, cheers, and let's get into it. It is January 1989 and we are in the west of Germany in the city of Hanau. 30-year-old Shannon Hilvers is on her way to her father's old hunting lodge. Now Shannon, she never really cared much for hunting. However, for her family, especially for her father and her two brothers, Matthew and Eric, hunting is more than just a hobby. It's actually somewhat of a family identity. Now let me tell you, Shannon would rather be anywhere else on the entire planet than at this haunting lodge. She didn't really have much of a choice though. She was basically summoned by her brothers Matthew and Eric to show up because they want to talk to her about their father who had recently passed. So more specifically, they want to talk to her about his inheritance. Their father was a doctor for the most part of his life, but in the second half of his life he made a fortune as the owner of a mechanical engineering company. Just to be clear, at the time of his death he owned the equivalent of 1.6 million dollars, which was now to go to his children. Now even though they are 1.6 million dollars at stake, Shannon right from the beginning didn't really expect much, just because she knew her father very well and his medieval persona. In her father's opinion, only men were capable of managing such a large fortune. And so he left his entire fortune only to his two sons. Not Shannon, not even his damn wife. Now, inheritance law is clearly regulated here in Germany. So contrary to Shannon's father's wishes, she would be entitled to at least a share of the inheritance. But now, her two brothers are standing in front of her at this haunting lodge, both of them several hundred thousand dollars richer. And the man Shannon, she give her part of the inheritance over to their mother, because after all, this poor woman was now a widow. Not that these two ever had the idea of using their own money to support their mother. No, instead Shannon, she should leave empty handed. So Shannon, she can't believe what she's hearing, understandably. Then on the other hand, she's not really surprised either, because this whole situation is actually just another one in a series of devious blows. It's been always like that. All the important decisions were made by her father and her two brothers. Even the father's funeral was planned and carried out by the two brothers over her head. And as a kid, as a teenager, as an adult, Shannon was never allowed to go hunting with them, even though hunting was such a big part of the family's life. At the end of the day, Shannon was nothing but a woman, and thereby at the very bottom of the family food chain. Eight years earlier, at the age of 22, Shannon met her future husband, George. Now, Shannon was smitten by George and he turned out to be a great man and a great life partner. He had a great sense of humor. He was loving. He was supporting everything you want in a man. And so it's only natural that she wants to introduce him to her parents and her brothers. And so they set a day to get to know each other. And babe, it was a disaster. And well, it was not George's fault. He was polite and charming and he showed up with respect. But George is absolutely not interested in hunting. And so according to them, he just does not fit into the family and he will never be part of the family as Shannon's father made abundantly clear. But Shannon doesn't care. She loves this man. 
and she wants to be with him. And so they get married, they have kids, they build a life together, and they have this really happy relationship. I mean, yes, George, he was never accepted by the family, big whoop. You know, Shannon's parents and her younger brother Matthew, they had moved to Austria like years ago, so they were not even part of her life anymore, so who cares what they think. And so while the rest of her family lived in Austria, Shannon and her family, they moved into the attic apartment of the family's home in Germany. But now there's this new situation. Father's dead and now there is this inheritance and Shannon is supposed to give it all away. So Shannon decides to seek some legal advice, but the lawyer advises her not to sue. I mean, the litigation would probably take for fucking ever and there was no promise of success. And so eventually Shannon gave in and she handed over her part of the inheritance to her mother. And so now that the father is dead and Shannon handed over her part of the inheritance over to her mother, I guess Shannon tried to again kind of reconnect with her mother. And so maybe in an attempt to make up with the mother, George and Shannon go pay her a visit. Disaster. Again. All of a sudden, Shannon's mother, she turned to George and she asked him how he was planning to support this big family with his simple, demeaning, run of the mills job. To which George replies, well, Mother, that's none of your fucking business now, is it? This in turn infuriates Matthew, who was also there and had been acting like the head of the family ever since they closed the casket. So Matthew goes over to George and he demands an apology, but George refuses. But this is when Shannon's relationship with her family absolutely hit rock bottom. And apart from that, George and Shannon don't have any reason to justify or defend themselves. They actually get along very well. They support each other in any way and George is a very hard worker. And over the last couple of years, he has worked his way up to the top to a top managing position at his firm. So they're fine. However, a couple of months later, Matthew moves back to Germany for a new job and he moves into the first floor apartment of the family house in Hanau meaning he was now living under the same roof as Shannon and her family. Legally speaking, that made it even worse, the house belonged to him. The mood changed. So example, one day Shannon left groceries in the hallway because they were so heavy she couldn't carry them up all by herself. And so Matthew, he just took the groceries and just throw them out in the streets. And then one day, like the rabbits or bunnies of Shannon's kids, they were just lying dead in the garden because this <coughs> set his hunting dogs on them. And then finally, Matthew gives Shannon and her family notice to move out. Dickhead. And so Shannon and her family, they decide to move a few blocks away into their own house, big garden, just perfect. And there is peace and there is quiet for six years. Until Shannon one day got a phone call from her older brother, Eric. Mom died. And so look, Shannon, she was not at home at the time. She was on a cure. And so she asked her brother, Eric, hey, can you maybe postpone the funeral until I get back? Because I really want to attend. But Eric was like, no, Matthew doesn't want to wait. And so the funeral just took place without Shannon. And now, again, there is an inheritance. But the funeral was the last straw. And now Shannon has had enough. She has had enough of the years of submission and unfair treatment. This time she's going to fight for her part of the inheritance. Always by her side, her beloved husband George supporting and encouraging her. So as expected, Matthew doesn't make it easy. You know, for example, he never hands over the documents Shannon's lawyer demanded. And Matthew the entire time was like, she didn't leave me an inheritance. All she left me was debt, which is nonsense because just the family house in Hanau, West Germany alone is worth more than half a million dollars. And then Shannon also knows that the family owns expensive jewelry and several valuable paintings. But this legal battle between Matthew and Shannon should last over four years years and it was nerve-wracking for Shannon and she was often on the edge of just giving up, giving in. If it was not for George, who always supported her, who always built her up and who always encouraged her to keep on fighting for what was rightfully hers. So the last court hearing where a decision was expected to be made was set to be mid-September of 2013 and Shannon actually has a good chance of winning. But for some reason, Shannon had this odd feeling in her stomach, like she felt something 
something was happening, something bad was gonna happen. And unfortunately, Shannon should be right when the 7th of September 2013 came along. And so it is half past 10 in the evening at the family's home. Now they have this recessed window glass in the wooden front door. This is an important detail, okay? So if the light is on in the living room, you can see from the outside if someone in the house is standing right behind the front door, okay? Remember that. So anyway, Shannon and the kids, they already went to bed, you know, it's been a long day, but George, he wanted to stay up a little bit longer and watch TV, but eventually he too felt tired and he fell asleep in front of the television. But George wakes up again shortly before midnight. Someone had knocked on the door. Now George, he doesn't think much of it. His eldest son, he had gone out to the street fest and he probably just forgot his keys. And so George, he gets up and he walks to the wooden front door and he opens it just a crack when suddenly shots are fired. Imagine this, through the still closed door, through the glass of the front door, George was shot by an unknown person four times and fatally wounded, he collapsed in the hallway. So Shannon and the kids, they obviously woke up from the gunshots and they ran downstairs and they find George lying in the hallway in the pool of his own blood and Shannon went into full-blown panic mode, understandably. And she just yelled to her kids, go get me some towels, get me some towels, because she just, she was just trying to stop the bleeding. And of course they called 911 and the emergency doctors really tried to save George's life, but in vain. And George died at the age of 46. And so from now on, forensics and investigators are a permanent guest. What is remarkable is that George was shot four times but there was only one single bullet hole in the glass of the wooden front door, meaning that whoever killed George was a practiced marksman. And I know what you're thinking, but no. So when Shannon was questioned, she explained that George actually had no enemies. I mean, yes, there was this dispute between her and her brother Matthew, but George actually didn't really have much to do with it all. I mean, he was just supporting. And yes, Shannon explained to investigators that her brother was indeed a moron, but that she never considered him to be capable of murder. However, Matthew was actually arrested a couple of days later for suspicion of murder. Now, Matthew didn't live in the family house in Germany anymore. He had moved to Austria again. But at the time of the murder, he was in Germany visiting his girlfriend. And his girlfriend lived merely 60 miles away from Shannon. However, Matthew claimed he had an alibi. At the time of the murder, he was at his girlfriend's place looking after her children because she wanted to go out that evening. And his girlfriend, Mary Ann, confirmed his alibi. And even after searching his house in Austria and her apartment in Germany, nothing really turned up that would connect him to the crime. And eventually, Matthew was released. Now, mind you, the legal dispute over the inheritance still went on, parallel to the murder investigation. And Shannon won. But Matthew appealed, saying that he would not pay her anything because she accused him of murder and that would make them even. And so three years go by. So it's now April of 2016 and Matthew, Mary Ann and her children are at the airport in Germany. They just came home from a vacation, right? So Mary Ann, she had moved to Matthew to Austria in the meantime, and the two of them actually had built a good life together. They lived in this big, luxurious house and they had made many new friends. One couple they were particularly fond of, Ahmed and Tessa. So one year earlier, Tessa had sent a message to Mary Ann on an auction platform because she wanted to buy a piece of furniture from her. But at the handover of this piece of furniture, the two women got along so well that they became really good friends. And it gets even better. Tessa's boyfriend, Amit, is an avid hunter. And so these two couples, they spend a lot of time together, they go on vacations together, and obviously now they're gonna pick up Matthew and Mary and from the airport. So Ahmed and Tessa, they came with two different cars, and on the way back, the woman and the children, they drove in one car together and the man took the other car. But on this car ride home, Ahmed all of a sudden makes a very strange statement, and he tells Matthew 
that he wants to harm a business rival competitor by planting a so-called party weapon on him. A party weapon is a gun that is not registered and had been used in a crime before. So Matthew, he doesn't hesitate one second and he tells Ahmed, well, lucky you, I can get you a gun like that. Just make sure that your business rival was in Germany on the 7th of September 2013 because this is the date when the weapon, the gun, was last used. So Ahmed is like, yeah, no problem, I'm gonna check that out. And he did. And as a matter of fact, his business rival, he was in Germany on the 7th of September. And so he buys the gun from Matthew and Matthew hands him over the gun. Not knowing that by that, he put the murder weapon right into the hands of police because Ahmed and Tessa are undercover police officers. Ahmed and Tessa had been on Matthew's tail for over three years and they found out more than just a couple of things about our buddy Matthew here. Matthew's high school diploma and medical degree? Fake. The job he claimed to have? Non-existential. The money he supposedly made was the inheritance, or more specifically, what was left of it. So Matthew Hilvers was arrested for the murder of George. His motive, according to the prosecution, he wanted to have the money for himself. His sister Shannon, she would have given in at some point if it wasn't for George, who kept on supporting and encouraging her. With George gone, it would secure the money for him and teach his sister a lesson to not mess with him. And so the trial eventually began and Shannon appeared as a co-plaintiff and she described to the court the years of submission and unfair treatment all the way up to the dead rabbits. Um, Matthew the entire time remained silent in court and he didn't really say much about the accusations. But then on the eighth day of the trial, something spectacular happened. Plot twist! So on this day, Matthew's girlfriend Marianne was supposed to testify. And when the judge entered the courtroom, she was already sitting in the witness box. And the first thing this judge did is he turned to Marianne and he asked her to stand up and leave the courtroom. Why? Well, investigators over the course of the trial had found out that Matthew was innocent and now she was charged with the murder of George. I know, I know, I know, get this. Matthew was charged with murder, okay? But he said he had an alibi, you know, watching Mary Ann's kids. Mary Ann confirmed this. And so investigators thought, okay, hmm, maybe it's not really good for the prosecution. Maybe we should look in on that a little bit more. And so they checked the phone data of Mary Ann and Matthew. Mary Ann told investigators that she was out with a friend that night and this friend confirmed this. He said that they were together the main course of the evening all the way up to 2 a.m. in the morning, right? Mary Ann said that they had gone to a concert together, which turned out to be true, but they didn't arrive at this concert as the phone data showed until half past midnight. Mary Ann's phone was turned off before the concert. However, she forgot about her friend's phone and it was turned on. And not only that, before the concert, this phone was locked in near the crime scene at the time of the murder. Also, Ahmed and Tessa, the undercover police officers, they spoke in court. And apparently, Matthew and Mary Ann had talked about the murder quite often. And surprisingly, they also knew what kind of gun was used to kill George, even though this hot little detail was never made public. Also, Matthew and Mary and they gossiped quite a lot and spoke very ill and very badly of George, especially Matthew. And to Ahmed and Tessa, it kind of seemed like the hatred had spread over to Mary Ann, even though she never met the guy. And she was not happy when she found out that her boyfriend Matthew over here had squandered the entire inheritance and that Shannon had a very good chance of winning in court over her share of the inheritance. So if Matthew would really have to pay her out, he would have to sell the house in Austria they both shared and both owned to pay Shannon out. She couldn't let that happen. 
And so Mary Ann came up with a plan. And for months she pressured Matthew into teaching her how to shoot a gun. And Matthew was so flattered because he thought that she was only like showing interest in his hobbies. And so on the 7th of September 2013, Mary Ann had her friend drive her all the way up to Hanau. She then told her friend to park the car in an unconspicuous side street and wait there for her because she, quote, had to take care of something. Matthew, in fact, sat at home and was watching her kids. Only when he heard about George's murder, he put two and two together. He did not know what she was planning, what she was up to. He was not involved. And so the court concluded that Mary Ann, in fact, acted alone and that Matthew was not involved in the murder, at least not directly. He was still charged with accessory to murder and sentenced to nine years in prison. I mean, he had given her the gun, he had showed her how to shoot a gun, and he had spread the hatred. Mary Ann was sentenced to life imprisonment. Poor Shannon, again, left empty-handed. Matthew never paid her anything because he simply couldn't. And not only that, but now her husband was dead and she had to raise four kids on her own. What the fuck? And so on behalf of the entire true crime community, Matthew, <laughs> hunt dogs. I need to calm down. Okay, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Let me know what you think down below. Also give this video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. It shows me that you enjoy what I do and I get excited every time. I think it's so cool. What else? Uh, oh yeah, if you don't have any plans next Friday, why don't you meet me here for another cocktail and of course, another mysterious true crime case. Thank you so much for your support. Mommy loves you.